Good afternoon to one and all, and welcome to the final day of CTIS 2021. And indeed, it has been a very exciting three days of the conference. And as we come to the last day, uh, just to quickly run you through today's events, we will start with the keynote where Coach Ken is running, move on to a teacher presentation session on CT and math, and then we have a special session on CS Pratshala. And of course, in the evening, we have a cultural program where we hope all of you will join in and show your skills in singing, dancing, whatever you have decided. But yeah, so without waiting, and uh, let me quickly hand over to Venki. So Venki is the session chair for the keynote. And uh, to introduce Venki, Venki has been part of CS Patshala right since its inception. Over to you, Venki. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Slani, who heads the Institute of Software Technology at uh, Graz University in Austria. He is very passionate about alleviating poverty, and he believes that can be done by teaching everyone to code. And he also believes that the best way to teach coding is to teach students how to make apps on mobile phones, because mobile phones are more accessible than uh, desktops or laptops, and apps are more entertaining than sorting or searching. Uh, so he is a founder member of uh, Catrobat, a project which aims, to, which is a open source free project to allows you to program apps uh, and connect to all kinds of devices uh, through your mobile phones. And a variant of that, a Code and Stitch won an innovation award at the university for building gender camp. It essentially allows uh, women programmers to do embroidery, I believe, and uh, uh, to program their embroidery. So it's not just elevating poverty, also building the gender camp that he believes. He's won several awards, including an IEEE Best Paper Award for uh, the work coming out of the Catrobat project. So I hand it over to Professor Slani to entertain us. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I have been in India many times, also just before the pandemic, and uh, I always enjoyed it a lot and have a lot of ongoing uh, work together with both institutions as well as students in India. Just this summer, I had the pleasure to mentor three students from India during the Google Summer of Code event in which we, Katrabad is a mentoring organization. But without further ado, let's jump into my presentation. And the first thing is, yeah, my slides. So I tried to close everything. Good. So to talk, as you have seen, and I was introduced, is about Catrobat. It's a project that I started 11 years ago. Uh, so it's a long-term project, and it's a free open source project that mainly relies on the work of students, volunteers from around the world. First of all, my motivation was that I was, I mean, always a teacher, but I was asked like 15 years ago to participate in an outreach program targeted at children from our university where I was supposed to teach young, young children in the age from eight to 12, how to become interested in computer science. And of course, I came to know various approaches and also learned about the concept of con uh, computational thinking. Uh, I recently heard that computational thinking was actually a word that was already used a long time ago 
by one of the proponents, the most famous proponents of teaching programming and computer science to children, Seymour Pepper from the MIT. And he's famous for many things, among others, the Mindstorms book, in which in one of the parts he mentioned computational thinking already in the you know 70s of, of last uh, century. So, oops, yeah. Here is one famous citation. You've not started your presentation. This is some other uh, screen. Okay. I'm surprised. It's a different window that is open. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's not obvious. I saw that. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Ah, I see, I see, I see. Just a moment, please. So I want to share my whole screen. Interesting. There seems to be no way to share the whole screen. Interesting. Okay, I will share. Just go to share screen. Yeah, uh, I tried. Uh, but it only offers me the different windows, not the whole screen, which is not useful. Uh, let me just check, maybe. Hmm. Anyway, I will start uh, with the PowerPoint. That should, and then I will switch to the uh, to the other window. So, is it now showing the site? Yes. Now it's, now it's now it's now it's fine. Good. Good. So this is one of the famous citations, uh, which is the basis of constructionism, which is a, is a learning theory pioneered by Seymour Papert, who was, uh, it's called constructionism. And it's in this citation, he's saying children learn best when they are actively engaged in constructing something. And that can be anything, uh, it can be, whatever they want, but if they have their own goal and they want to do something about it, construct it, then they will, you know, do whatever is necessary to research it, to, to do it, to learn from it, and to internalize whatever knowledge is necessary. And he started with those robots that could draw on a paper because it was something that was uh, where people could take it into their hands and create something with mathematics. He was a mathematician. One of his other famous citations, which are very relevant to the settings, I mean, the, the topic of this conference is the following. Every maker of video games knows something that the makers of curriculum don't seem to understand. You'll never see a video game being advertised as being easy. Kids who do not like school will tell you it's not because it's too hard, it's because it's boring. And uh, this brings me to the barriers that I have identified in the course of my many years of working with children and teaching and various studying various approaches to the barriers to computational thinking or bringing computational thinking to young people. So there are many topics. Right? The one that uh, Seymour Papert just addressed was the part about the interest. So there must be motivation. It must be interesting to them. It must be meaningful to them so that they even you know, consider wanting to spend, to, to use their brains uh, thinking about it and computational thinking is a lot about thinking. Then they also need the time. I have tried to work with mathematicians in schools and in at least in Austria here, the problem is that they don't have any time to do that. They don't have, because the curriculum is so full with things that there is no flexibility in introducing any new concepts. Students have to learn about trigonometry and you know 
geometry and whatever, differentiation, integration, and so on. But uh, the outcome, to be honest, is quite poor. And yeah, it's, but I mean, this is a general problem. There's not enough time here also. And also we are competing. Computational thinking is competing with other interests like, uh, I don't know, watching Bollywood movies or, you know, using social media and what else. So we are also competing here for the time of students because one thing is clear, if you look at the theory, the psychological theory of flow from the uh, Hungarian-American psychologist Csikszentmihalyi, flow is where you, you know, you, you dive into some topic and forget about time and, uh, you know, other, other things you want to do. Once you go into this flow state, time will flow. Yeah. And that means you need a lot of time. And that's also something that is uh, usually not available in a school setting. Because there, there the time is sliced up into many small uh, pieces. And there's not enough time compared to, you know, whatever is needed to really achieve complex goals to construct something. Gender, surprisingly, is also a topic uh, this is a little bit surprising, but I have observed that almost everywhere there are a few exceptions. And there have been studies showing that, I mean, for whatever reason, be it societal or, you know, genetic, whatever reasons, uh, there is a dichotomy between the interests of uh, boys and girls into technology, not so much into mathematics, but into technology, especially, you know, whatever the reasons, but it's a fact of life. And there are some surprising exceptions, like I will show you later, where technology and uh, female interests surprisingly meet. And, and uh, where, we, where we have a chance to change things. Then there's also the question of basic skills, which is, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a big barrier if people, if young people cannot read or do not have a basic understanding of mathematics. And that seems to be the case in various areas in the world, also including in India, as far as I learned, because the literacy rate is not equally high everywhere in India, as we all know, but it's not limited to India, of course. It's to some degree everywhere in the world. So that's a, another issue. And then there's the big issue, which is very relevant for schools, which is where do we get the computers from? If we think about computational thinking and what software to use, which is less a problem, mainly it's a problem about the computers and the space in schools, and also to a large degree to the knowledge of teachers and the skills they have to teach these things. If I look now at the number of participants, it's a free event, it's on a weekend, there's no school. I see there are currently 68 participants. Uh, well, you know, I have participated in many, 69 now, I have participated in many such events and there have been events in a similar, in a similar direction uh, since 50 years and it doesn't change. So, you know, it's very nice that you're all here, that you listen to all those nice talks, but it's not sufficient. Uh, it, it doesn't have any impact, I'm sorry to say, even if I give a talk in the largest uh, newspaper, in, uh, for the largest newspaper, I mean, an interview or do it in, in the news, uh, in the Austrian national TV, doesn't help, it doesn't reach uh, children. Yeah? So the impact is under the question. Uh, and language, surprisingly, language. Yeah. Uh, 
all of you speak English, I speak English, even though it's not my native language. And uh, yeah, most of us adults speak English, but it's, it's not really true for the world. I remember when I was in Chennai, I met uh, two years ago, I met quite a number of, for instance, drivers uh, who couldn't speak any English, but their general level of intelligence was very high. I mean, basically we all have supercomputers in our brains um, and they have many skills and I'm sure that they wouldn't have any problems with computational thinking if we let them, if we give them the access, but the language is still a problem because they don't speak uh, English and most of the programming languages on a worldwide scale are written in English. In China, there is a Chinese version of Python that is quite popular. So I understand this is also a problem everywhere in the world besides the English speaking countries or the English speaking populations. But for children especially, it's not that obvious. So language is another part. And the last part here is, uh, well, <laughs> this is something that is maybe a little bit strange, but uh, you know, uh, human civiliz civilization is not static. There's always something new coming up. And yeah, there have been, well, I would say exponential technical developments in, in the last, uh, well, since the beginning of civilization. And we are now in a new phase where we, you know, lead the planet, understand the brain, understand biology, understand a lot of things, um, are in the process of reaching the point where we can automatize uh, rational thought and maybe also more than rational thought. So I have been shocked. I have been shocked really hard about the jumps and leaps that have been done in the field of artificial intelligence in the last two years or less or four years, we can say. Uh, I just looked at my wife yesterday. She showed me uh, some app that allows her with a few clicks to make uh, small movies with her face where she perfectly dances and sings in a Bollywood movie, which was, you know, really shocking for me. And then she made a, a small movie where I was playing James Bond. Uh, and I just saw that Google uh, published a new API this summer that allows to emulate natural speech in a very natural way which sounds perfectly like from a human. And, you know, with, pan with the pandemic and every, everything going virtual and uh, all of this it becomes more and more difficult to understand whether the, you know, the person on the other side is really a human or is maybe, you know, the next step of evolution. So I also, integrated into our software recently GPT-3, the famous the new um, AI from OpenAI. And it's surprising, you know, you can ask it any question, it will give meaningful answers and it even has common sense. You can give it new, uh, new you know, exercises or you know, tasks or situations and it will react like a human. And GPT-4 is coming out reportedly by the end of this year. And then many other you know, companies like Google or Amazon or some Chinese companies who produce larger and larger AI. So for me, I was shocked and, and actually surprised. And many people were surprised how quickly it's now going. Um, there is also a kind of famous famous uh, live demo of code x which will be integrated now or is already integrated into uh, into github as a coding body so it's it has really become easy even though it's still the beginning to program together with someone else and the other person is not a person but an ai ai 
So that's quite shocking. So I think all of this, what we are talking about now, education, schools, and so on, will be tremendously impacted by, by these changes in a way that we cannot even imagine. And it's coming very, very soon. And I don't know what to think about it. I would be interested in hearing your, your thoughts about this in the discussion. Anyway. We try in our project to address all these points, yeah, all of them, but that also means that some of them are not intuitive and we have to break with sense that how it, have, how it has been done in the past because looking to the last 50 years, all those attempts that were made uh, didn't work, yeah, didn't work. I'm very sorry to say, but it didn't work because there were some barriers. All of them happened. Uh, all of them are happening now. And I'm not claiming that I have the perfect solution, but I try at least to address most of those things. How? We'll see now. So first, uh, yeah, this is the motto, you know, low floor, white walls, high ceiling. That's the, that's the motto of the Scratch project and the Scratch project is perfect. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful project, uh, which I mean, I'm using Scratch. We're working together with the Scratch team. We're exchanging. We're using the software from them in our own software. So, so the Scratch code is integrated partly into the Catrobat code. And it's uh, wonderful. I would say it's my, it's our elder sister project yeah so the elder sister series low floor you know meaning it's really easy to enter the room white walls means uh, yeah you, you have many possibilities and high ceiling you can you, you can go very much up actually white wall means that, that uh, many people can participate and some of the things that they did for instance offering the software in a large number of, of languages i think they have I'm not sure, but I think more than 60 languages in which the software is offered. And I guess all of you know Scratch, so I won't say anything more about this. But this was really our inspiration. And Catrobat is like the you know little uh, sister project of Catrobat. Uh, so little sister, but a little bit different. Low floor, white walls, high ceiling, that's all in the room. It's like in the classroom, right? you have a room. And we thought, this came up later, that we actually don't need to stay in the classroom. We want to go outside. And with a smartphone, it's possible to go outside. As it was mentioned, Catrobat is entirely based on smartphones. Because going back here, that gives us the devices and the space. And Catrobat is the software. So these three things are basically addressed. The role also because we try to go into all possible places wherever. If you look at the world, you'll see in a moment. Yeah? And the sky, because uh, it's possible to mount the phone on satellites. It's we, we can control um, drones. I, I have shown this already in the past uh, in, in when I was in Chennai at the university and gave a talk. I you know we had the the drone live program and flying in front of the participants. So that was kind of fun. It's not possible to show it now, but basically that's our motto and also part of the, uh, the title of the talk. So, but let's look at these few statistics here. Here you see uh, evolution from 2009, I think, till 2017, and it continues in the same way. Here, the blue line is the number of, I mean, the, the, the market share in desktop PCs, including also laptops. Uh, the green line are smartphones and uh, the violet one is tablets. And you see a clear trend here. And this, this includes everyone, companies, you know, everyone. So there's a clear trend towards more and more smartphones and less and less uh, computers. Uh, and you, I mean, everyone knows this, 
This is how the statistic looks for India. It's even more pronounced, so it's very clear that there is something going on. If you look at young people, it's even much more pronounced. And wherever you go nowadays, I know that in India also some of the local governments are basically gifting smartphones and uh, you know tariffs and everything to to young people who do not have already their own smartphone and this basically solves the the one access problem that we have that we had for the last 50 years which was the access uh, to the computers and it, it's not solved by giving laptops etc to school children first of all it's quite expensive but there's also the problem that you need always new ones and this doesn't happen it never happened in the past it never worked so this is uh, the, the smartphones that the kids own themselves is something that solves the device problem the computer problem because those smartphones are powerful computers they are very fast compared to all the computers also the laptops and they have higher resolution and they have better access to the internet and so on also i have to say that i found that the internet the cost for mobile uh, data is very very low in india yeah? so it's something that is uh, also in favor of using smartphones but there are psychological uh, reasons why smartphones in schools are a difficult topic which is also understandable because it's a big distraction for kids because there are games on it there's the social media the movies there's some i mean music and whatever so it's it's not an easy solution to use smartphones but as an aside the same can be said also about computers so yeah and too much control is actually the opposite of good very often so if you force someone to do it there will be a lot of reaction and the learning effect is not perfect so uh yeah um let me say uh, capture that as as was mentioned we have we have done things with uh, with stitching machines uh, so that's one part of the approach how we tried to make it more attractive to girls and it was actually very very successful um, so the the response from all over the world china japan you know everywhere in the world african countries was very good because that's something those stitching machines uh, which allows you to put some patterns on your clothes they somehow um, um, they, they are very attractive to all young people but especially to your girls because it has something to do with fashion with design and it allows to combine mathematics and uh, programming skills together to create something beautiful that you can also show to other people so it's it's very attractive to young people especially females and it's a good approach to bring uh, programming skills or computational thinking skills to those young people and we combine it with the smartphone so now it's possible to create patterns whatever patterns you want with as many colors as you want on your smartphone transfer it to some embroidery machine and then uh, put it on your t-shirts or trousers or you know, anything and it also can be combined with electronics so you can you know make it shine or such things so it's it's a something uh, directly in this direction of um, uh, making uh, creating something producing something putting making your own goals and then realizing for instance i was very uh, interested in uh, creating a Christmas present and let me show that to you for my wife using uh, our software and uh, I'll share another screen now mm -hmm. okay. yeah here so this is a this is a bookstore a publisher from actually from India uh, the London Jungle book a uh, very nice book from uh, some very actually quite famous uh, artist from India 
who came to London and interpreted this was his first trip to a foreign country and uh, first trip to a large city and he interpreted everything he saw there uh, in terms of his uh, art and my wife translated this book to another language and uh, I, I, I'm not sure, do you see the photo of the t-shirt? It's yes, from, yes, yes, we are from, seeing the photo of the t-shirt. Yeah, so, so this is the this is one part where you see the, you know, that was his interpretation of the English people in, uh, in, in, in London uh, represented as bats hanging from the tree uh, where he described it, that was his impression, where there was, they were hanging out at night in the pubs and <laughs> discussing their thing. So this was my motivation to create this, uh, this t-shirt for my wife as a, you know, as a picture. And it was made with 20,000 uh, stitches on an embroidery machine and took me quite some time to create it. But I mean, I, I made a huge program for this to, to actually be able to tr transpose the art into this, uh, this uh, image. So it was very, you see, in my case, of course, I cannot uh, translate it to, to, the, to the young people, but I see it all the time when we do events uh, with, with uh, kids about the embroidery, it's very popular and I fully understand it. So now let me try to again change the screen because I want to show you also practical things. Uh, how, because now I was talking all the time, I want to show you a little bit the software. Let's see if I can do it here. Ah, yes. Yes. Good. So again, I have to share the screen. So this is the, you know, the, the software, it's called Pocket Code. It's an app for Android and iOS iPhones. And it allows us to uh, create Small, I mean, small or large programs uh, using a programming language similar to Scratch, which actually can do a, a few more things, taking advantage of all the capabilities of modern smartphones. But first, I want to show you here this is a sample project from embroidery, and it's just a very small pattern. Each dot that you see is one stitch, and this pattern can now be exported here with this embroidery um, effect to some other program and you know then actually stitched on a t-shirt but this is just a small mathematical example you can do whatever as you saw in my other picture uh, whatever you want and this is just with nine bricks that you know represent the the code basically. I want to show you, before I show you how to program, a few other examples, but also how this looks like. So the newest projects are really the newest project that have just been uploaded. And it's a huge project. Uh, so we have uh, all together more than 5 million downloads from the various stores and so on. So it's popular, but I have to say, it's also growing exponentially. Last year, at, uh, at the beginning of last year, we had only 2 million and now we have 5 million. So it's really going up. The pandemic also actually helped because uh, more young people had time at home to play with their phones. phones and yeah, it's, it's growing on a worldwide scale. Let's see if it continues like this after the pandemic. But yeah, anyway. so. Here's another nice example. This is a jigsaw puzzle that uh, also, you know, like, I'm not sure how fluid it is, but here on my screen, it looks very fluid. So all those puzzle pieces uh, fell down. And now 
uh, if you look, uh, you will see my finger is a white dot here. And I can do, you know, I can turn the pieces like this and also use several fingers to, to move them up, all up in one uh, place. I'm not sure, I think this one is here in the corner, if I'm not mistaken. Well, yeah, so this, uh, this piece now in the, in the left top corner is, is fixed. Uh, so, uh, let's see, is this here below? Yeah. So now I have those two and so on. So what, what does this show? Actually, it's quite interesting. I mean, first of all, it shows that uh, it's possible to use multi-touch and multi-touch uh, would be, I mean, up to 10 fingers is not something that is obvious on, on another device. But why is multi-touch interesting? We don't have any special, you know, special capabilities for the multi-touch. Uh, for those of you who know Scratch, it's like in Scratch, uh, you can access the point where the finger is touching, but beyond that, there are just mathematical functions. So if kids want to create such a puzzle, they will need a lot of trigonometry and also functions like arc tangents too, which you know I learned especially to fix this. But this is the interesting point. I learned about this. I had to research it because I wanted to achieve some goal. And it was a difficult goal, but I, I achieved it. And it's the same. We see this again and again with kids. When they have some goal that they set for themselves, not from someone else, but which they decide themselves and they want to solve it and we are giving them the capabilities to do it, then they will do the necessary research. It's also a fantastic time now because of the internet. So it's, it has become possible to do this. And it's not obvious to, to be able to do this, but yeah, it has become possible. So um, yeah. So this is another uh, small program that was created uh, with, uh, with the pocket code here. Let me see a few others that I can show you and then I will show you how to program actually. And also, you know, address anything. Oh, this was also an interesting thing. I, when I was in Chennai, my wife also visited some specialist artist lady who uh, was a specialist about Kolam. And, uh, you know, she explained to us everything, how, how she did the columns and so on. And then I, while I was waiting for all of this, I made a small program that allows me to also draw things like, uh, you know, columns or looking a little bit like columns, if you know that. Uh, and I showed it to her and she was absolutely fascinated and actually talking to me more than <laughs> to my wife and starting to program in job. She was a kind of, uh, you know, not, not so young lady, but she was totally fascinated by being able to draw suddenly those, those uh, images on her own phone. And it was also like this, if I shake it, it will go away and then it can start again, you know whatever. So this was, you know, it's all about motivation, whatever is motivating for you, if you want to, to solve Sudoku's or if you want to create some, you know, for instance, I don't know, um, this, this is a, a perfect watch, which I, I mean, I, I'm showing you the programs that I made, but I, I made this while I was brushing my tools, just to see whether I could do it. And it's a watch that is, this is showing the local time here in Austria, is more perfect than the real watch because it, uh, you never have to, I mean, it has the perfect time from the internet, even taking into account um, those, um, uh, you know, the, the, the seconds that switch sometimes at the beginning of a year and so on. So it's really perfect more perfect than the one that uh, exists in reality. So it's, you know, with virtual thing, it's not such a big thing. 
between uh, reality and, and not. Here, this is another program which takes into account the face detection. So here I'm steering this small panda with movements of my head. I mean, real movements in front of the camera taking into account the, and it counts. Huh? It counts how often I bumped the ball. There are other similar games that I can do, uh, but this, of course, this one, uh, the next one only works if I have my phone connected to a big screen like I have here. So what it does basically is that I am using all the sensors, the inclination, acceleration, magnetic field sensors, integrate those numbers and use the phone like a V controller from Nintendo um, towards the big screen uh, when I project the image from my phone to the large smart TV or something like this, or in this case, my computer. So if I do this, I can basically play with uh, using my, my phone. I can move the phone around, Oops, sorry. Not so gifted there, but I don't know if you see where I play like this, I'm moving this up and down. So this is really my phone that I can use like a, like a controller to, uh, to play with this phone. And for those of you who know Scratch, we did, we added a few things besides all those sensors and so on. Uh, we added a concept which is very useful, it's the concept of scenes. So here you see a program, The Binding of Krishna, was, was, which was made by, uh, oops, I think I lost the connection, just give me a moment. Do you still see my screen? Probably not, right? So I'll just uh, reconnect. Yes, see you, right? Yeah, that's good, that's good. <laughs> and I have to reconnect. Uh, I think I touched the wrong. <laughs> just a moment. So, Besides, as I, um, while I'm reconnecting, I will explain a little bit. Besides the, what is the problem? Besides the sensors, we introduced a few new things, which, yeah, now it works again. To make it, more interesting. Um, and one of them was the possibility to create larger, larger games. So now I have to share again. And each of those buttons here, each of those menu entries are like its own scratch program with, it, with its own uh, background and its own objects, actors or objects, we call them, or sprites. So this allows us to create much larger projects. In this case here, for instance, it's a, it's a small program where we, you know, like have, it's with sound also, I, I'm not sure if you hear the sound also. Uh, it's very nice sound. So this is a, a game with some background story about uh, Krishna and you know the story and so on, it's all going on. But I will skip that now. And what I can basically do here is I can control Krishna and you know go to the next room and there are some opponents that I have to fight and collect some things here. Uh, I can you know, uh, hit them and yeah, whatever. So, so this becomes more and more complex. And this is also something to be played on the large screen and can be as complex as possible. I just want to 
say this has many levels, this game, and becomes more and more complex. And it's really a big game uh, with, with lots of uh, lots of code behind it. So it's possible to create huge games. And this game was programmed by five uh, students from actually from India who programmed on this for two months, all of them computer science university students, five of them for two months. So it can be quite large and complex. It's not limited. It looks as if it was for children, but actually the complexity can be very high, and because it's structured into scenes, into objects, into you know uh, different things, it's very object oriented in a some limited sense, but in a in a good sense, which allows to make really huge uh, projects. Uh, and it's also possible to interact with the internet. I was mentioning already GPT-3. I'm not allowed to show you the live version of GPT-3 uh, because of the of the licensing restrictions for the beta version, but um, yeah, it works. Yeah, so you can actually using the speech recognizer and using the speech synthesizer, you can talk with GPT-3 about anything you know, with just a few lines of code, of pocket code here of, of Catamap. So let me show you how to make a new program because there's another thing that I want to show, uh, which is a kind of demo. Uh, and here, I will now create a new object from my media library. We have this huge library of objects, actors and objects that can be, can be used. And uh, let me choose this uh, small penguin here. So I'll download it and then I can penguin. And now I have it here. And I can, uh, yeah. First of all, here I have the list of uh, possible bricks. Yeah. So there's also the possible ability here with your bricks to create new bricks. And for instance, here in device, we have those bricks that allows us to access the internet or open web pages or download images from, uh, from the web, which is also quite useful. It's possible to create, for instance, something like Google Maps with this, uh, because there are many services, APIs on the internet that allow us to, um, to, to get map data basically. But in this case, I will show you also something that is uh, quite useful to create games. Basically, it's the possibility to use a built-in physics engine. So if I do this, the penguin will fall down because the default direction for gravity is downwards. And then what I can do is I can make it a little bit smaller and also uh, say that it should bounce from the walls. So you see, it's very quick. I'm just selecting things here. Uh, and it's also very similar to Scratch. For those of you who know Scratch, there's this forever loop and if on edge bounds, this is another thing here. Huh? All the text that you see, all the explanations are very straightforward. It's not abbreviated. There's uh, we use uh, common language so that people usually understand. Even young children understand what we mean. Of course, not for everything. They don't know yet about gravity, but they can try it out. Nothing can be broken, so it's very straightforward. So if I do this then we'll have this penguin just bouncing around. And one interesting thing is here that it's not a square, it's really cut out and it's cut out on the, fl on the fly. So we have here our, our oops, what is it? Interesting, I'm not sure why it's in landscape mode, but yeah, we'll use it in landscape then. Uh, so here I can,
yeah, I can I can add some some special things here. And if I do this and then save this and play again, you will see that the new parts are again correctly used to bounce, and this is immediately integrated into the object. And then I could, for instance, add some um, another event if if the object bounces from the, any edge, then I want to add a small vibration, of course, not a vibration of one second, that's too long, but uh, something like 10 milliseconds. And then if I do this, I will feel the bouncing. Yeah? So each time it, it connects, I will feel how the phone vibrates a little bit. What else do we have? I can also change the, uh, the direction of the gravity, which I have here. I can set the gravity in the physics engine. And in this case, um, um, I need, you know, minus 10 is pointing down. So uh, here I have all the sensors. So if I multiply, for instance, with the uh, uh, inclination, and I can try that out, what, what kind of numbers this gives me. This actually, uh, if I hold the phone in the normal way, this gives me large negative numbers. And if I turn it in the other direction around the x-axis, it becomes large. So this will you know, uh, do it correctly for the x-axis. I'll do something similar here for the for uh, for the uh, for the x inclination in the in the other direction and if i do this i can it will fall down in whatever way i hold my phone in the right direction and so this allows it to you know with a few touches of my finger on the screen without typing anything to create something that is already going in the direction of games. And games uh, games are something that uh, makes sense for kids because they play games. I mean, adults also play games, but that's something very natural to, to do. And uh, yeah, so I showed you many things. There, there are lots of other things in the program. It's a huge program uh, project. Um, yeah. Uh, lots, uh, you know, there, there's the whole website where basically you have you have millions of projects that are shared from students with other, you know, not students, but young people, children. Then you have a scratch converter where you can import uh, scratch projects and you have a huge number of extensions which can be activated in the settings, for instance, the embroidery extension or there is robots, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and so on. Yeah, so there's a lot here. And there's there are also uh, accessibility settings for users with uh, special needs like cognitive or motoric or visual impairments. So we, we try to you know, do whatever is possible to support as many kids as possible. Yeah. Going back to my slides, um, I want to explain a little bit more. Um, oh yeah. So it's here. So yeah, it's a. Um, uh, we have a history of 11 years. So, for instance, we did uh, the game jam, worldwide game jam, also in India, about Alice in Wonderland in 2015. We did another one with Samsung. And now we are doing events with Huawei. We are trying to do, you know, to make it attractive. And my, game, my aim is to have some impact on the world. So that's why the project is large and can be sustained for a long time. I have seen many similar projects besides the spread projects project, but others. Uh, and 
all those, especially all the commercial projects, uh, had a limited lifetime. Right? So, because there's not much money in education, I have to be honest, and all the companies that uh, try to do something in this area are not very successful because uh, people are not willing to invest a lot of money in uh, this kind of education about computational thinking. So my approach is to make it all free and have volunteers help. And then there are some companies that also like to help, which is very welcome. But currently we mainly, I mean, to, to more than 95%, we rely on the work on, of volunteers. So here, um, there's a small statistics from uh, OpenHub, which is a site that collects statistics about uh, open source projects. And uh, as you see, we have 682 contributors on GitHub who have helped create this code. And it's an equivalent based on some, you know, old models, known established models of uh, computer science of 663 years of effort if everything would have been done by a single person. So it's quite huge. And there has been a lot of work that has been, I mean, that has been already done, but there's still a lot what we want to do. For instance, you know, starting from 3D versions up to things like code X, where kids have a coding body that they can ask any kind of questions and get help in their programming or, you know, control more things like augmented reality and all this. It's limit, in, a, in a limited way, it's already possible now, but there's so much more work to do if we have the time, you know, I have to say with all these things now coming up with AI and I don't know, maybe the singularity coming up, whatever. <laughs> we'll see in the next years, but yeah, we'll continue to do our best. And by the way, those 682 contributors are only the developers. We also have lots of contributors who are not developers, who are not included here, namely translators, designers, people who help us with the social media and uh, educators, also lots of educators that help us create the wiki and resources that can be used then in schools and also by the kids themselves. Though I have to say that uh, the best way for us to reach out to the kids to, to, to get them interested is not at all through schools. We have done so much with schools, but to be honest, it has limited impact. The biggest impact are the app stores, which have billions of users and, and customers worldwide, and our software is free there, and kids simply discover it. That's it. And so they discover it, and that will be uh, the largest part. And the second biggest part is what the kids are doing themselves. Basically, they are creating YouTube videos on a huge scale. There's no chance to you know, see this. It's all over the world. It's massive and it's the best way to recruit new users for our project. So yeah, coming back to the, to the slide with the barriers, we try to capture the interest through our approach to allow them to solve their own problems, be it new games or whatever else. Time is um, difficult, but since we are out of school, uh, it, it's possible to enter the, this, this flow state for them and be completely engrossed in whatever they are doing with our software. And this is happening a lot that we have seen this with, with kids spending days and I mean, weeks on their projects, which would never be possible in a school schedule. Then gender, you know what we are doing here. There, there are also other events, but uh, basically uh, one I have the biggest hopes now is this whole area of design and creating art, which is uh, wonderful. 
basic skills we try to address in making it as simple as possible. And it's also related to the one before the last, the language part, uh, because we make it available in uh, also close to 50 languages, including, you know, African language. Africa is a big challenge because they have more than 3,000 living languages, which is uh, yeah, a challenge for everyone uh, doing software for, for those areas. Then devices is clear, software is free. Space, meaning that uh, since we are out of the school context uh, and the, the phone can be taken wherever you want, you can use it. The users, the kids can use it wherever they want. So there's no need for a computer room or some special area. They can just use it outside, in their home, in the car, in the subway, wherever they want. And the knowledge part is that uh, we try to make all the knowledge publicly available uh, through wikis, through websites, through uh, videos, especially those videos created by the users themselves in their languages, because we can't uh, do the best video in Portuguese for Brazil or you know, in Russian or Chinese or whatever. So all of this is done by the users and much better than we can do it. And there is no need because of the internet nowadays for having skilled teachers. It's, it's a fact of life because, you know, I, I love teachers like you, 124, 123 people um, attending here now, but you are the absolute elite and it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale for 50 years. So the way to scale is through uh, accepting that there must be other ways like using YouTube and wikis and the internet. And that works perfectly well. Uh, and language I was talking already. And the last point is, is evolution. And here I see now the future and that's linked to the knowledge part of doing things similar to codex. Uh, so having, uh, having someone an AI that can be asked for help, whatever else happens. And with this, I see that I'm already two minutes over my allot time, and there should be some time also for discussion and questions. I see that there are uh, many chat messages. I haven't looked at them, but yeah, please, I will close now at this time, and I, I welcome your questions. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Uh, the chat is full of appreciations for the talk. Uh, so okay. There are a couple of uh, questions. Uh, the first one is, how does one adopt this? If they want to adopt in their schools? Okay. Uh, you mean for schools? Uh, yeah, I guess it is for schools. Yeah. It's for so, yeah. as I mentioned, uh, first of all, you have to accept uh, if you want to use it, yeah? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that it should be used in schools because I recognize that there are many barriers to use it in schools. One of them being to allow uh, kids to use smartphones in schools. But if you want to use it in schools, there are good ways to do it. And we have studied it and uh, published some papers. It was a uh, research that was funded by the European Commission, because clearly in Europe, we are also interested in solving the same problems like about the devices. So if you can bring yourself as a teacher to experiment with allowing kids to use their own smartphones, not devices, not tablets from schools or whatever, because that makes huge problems. Uh, imagine you have to update them or charge them every night. Yeah, so forget about this. If you can bring yourself to allow kids to use their own smartphones, then there are ways. But then there are more barriers. Like, for instance, you also have to experiment with allowing them to set their own goals, which is also something that goes against everything that you, you usually allow in schools, as far as I know. I mean, there are exceptions. Yeah? There are very good schools that, for instance, uh, use the constructionist approach where 
you can allow kids to create, uh, to set their own goals and then let them and uh, support them in doing it. And that works perfectly, but it takes a lot of courage to do that as a school teacher or as a director. And then, you know, my, my approach is simply to have kids, um, for instance, let's say in, in a course about uh, history, yeah, history. Let's say you learn about uh, ancient um, Indian history. Wonderful, huh? maybe select some area. And then ask simply as a teacher, I would ask the kids, okay, you now have one month, uh, let's make a competition. Everyone in the class is allowed to make a game about this and that area. You, you have to do a little bit of research about what happened during that time. And then, you know, make a, make whatever you want. That can be an animation, it can be a simulation, it can be a quiz, it can be, you know, whatever you want. And if you want to work in small teams, you're welcome, yeah? because not everyone is gifted in programming. Some people are more in the storytelling area, some are good in design, others uh, will contribute the music and so on. So uh, if you let them, they will enjoy it and they will learn a lot while doing it, because if they enjoy it, then automatically they will be more involved and remember later in a much better way what they learn instead of just learning for some test. So that's my advice, but I understand that it takes a lot of courage for schools and especially teachers to try this out. It's not something that is obvious. Yeah, thank you. That question was by Shweta Gupta. Uh, now, if I jam or Ramurujan has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Jan. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. It's always uh, wonderful to uh, listen to this. Uh, so, I have a couple of questions. One is about uh, collaborative learning and social interaction. Uh, there is always this apprehension that working with apps might uh, reduce that for kids. So, that's one thing in terms of projects, can we address them? That's one. Now there is uh, about the kids' growth. I mean, uh, as they learn more, you know, stepped up challenges or graded uh, projects, uh, you know, for pedagogic purposes, uh, how are they, uh, you know, I, I don't know how uh, these have been thought through. So I would like to hear more on these, yeah. Yeah, so about the collaboration, and then you have the same problem if you do it with uh, traditional computers, because then people sit in front of the computer and, you know, everyone has a desk. Actually, it's easier with smartphones to do it because there you can move around and people look at the same screen. I see this all the time. Young people come together and, you know, work together, show themselves each other what they're doing and asking questions. So, also, we have to say that the smartphones nowadays for young people are a communication device. And in that age, the social interaction is also very important. They learn how to you know, communicate with each other and they use the smartphone as their primary communication device, especially now in times of the pandemic where they cannot meet in real life, this is actually something that has been become essential all around the world. Uh, of course, there are problems. Yeah, it's not the same uh, going outside and playing, you know, doing sports and so on. So we, sh we shouldn't completely neglect that. But the fun thing is actually with the phone, you can do that outside. You can very easily, I mean, for instance, make a program that allows you to compute your velocity when running or the speed of your batting if you if you play cricket or something like this. All of this can be done uh, with smartphones. So smartphones are very compatible with all kinds of, um, yeah, of activities also, and especially with communi communicative and collaborative activities. I think more so, than with traditional approaches with uh, traditional computers. The second part about how to integrate that into uh, the you know, curriculum and way how to assess the capabilities. Uh, this is of course something that, I mean, this has to be looked at from, from a, 
uh, from a traditional point of view, because for instance, you cannot control as a school teacher what the entrance exam for some university would be or what the companies expect from those uh, pupils that you supervise. So I, I know from uh, one very nice school in Thailand, in Bangkok, which is totally focused on constructionists and there are no teachers in the school, only scientists that, uh, that supports, support the kids. They, in the last year, when, when some of the students or most of the students decide they want to, uh, to challenge themselves and enter university, they will just learn for the entrance exam and they all succeed very well because they became very self-organized and very you know, focused in their work because they had to rely on themselves. It's a challenge also for the kids and not all of them will manage and not all the parents are also compatible with this approach. But it's something that has been successful in those areas where the schools and the teachers could bring themselves to try it out. And yeah. it's not okay. obvious. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a challenge. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Vidit Kapoor. Uh, how does this compare with the MIT app inventor? Yeah. So App Inventor is another program that was uh, uh, inspired also, to be honest, uh, by, by Scratch. And the way App Inventor went, I mean, I, I think it's great. Huh? It's, it's a wonderful program as well. The way it went is that it's a mixture because you need still the PC to program and then you create an app. So the motivation with the app is still there, but you still have the problem that you need a device. You need a traditional computer. So that limits it in a certain way. And there are also some other aspects. Uh, some of them are um, around, uh, let's say our approach is much more game oriented. So we have this physics engine and so on, whereas uh, with App Inventor, it's much easier to make more serious applications that have, you know, the traditional lists and all those things. So it's more, I would say, I mean, I have seen many games also created with App Inventor, but on, in a general uh, thing, it's possible to make more business-oriented apps with it as well, which is not easy with, with our approach. We are totally focused on games only. And the third aspect is, in my opinion, that uh, because we have this, this hierarchy of scenes and objects, uh, which do not exist in App Inventor, it's actually much, much easier in Catrobat to make larger projects with 10,000 of command lines, basically, uh, which because of the structuring, are much easier to, to, to organize in one brain. So about the computational thinking aspect, I, but it's a limited experience with App Inventor, I have the feeling that Caterpillar allows to create more uh, complex and larger programs. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have time for one last question. This is an anonymous question. Can you give an example on how can gender be a barrier? Uh, excuse me, I didn't. Understand. Can you uh, can you give an example on how can gender be a barrier? Yeah, gender can be a barrier um, in that way. I mean, it's 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 area uh, restricted. But if you look at IITs and the number of female versus uh, male students, you you will see. Excuse me, but there is a difference. Yeah? <laughs> and also if you look in industry, but it's more pronounced in Western countries. There has been a huge study about over many, many countries over decades, which showed that the higher actually the economic development index, index was for a country, the less female you had in technology fields. So if you look at uh, some countries like Malaysia, they have very high number of female computer science students. 
No? Because there, uh, if, if you want to succeed as a boy, you will study uh, petrol uh, industry eh? and <laughs> not computer science. Eh? And if you look at Austria, for instance, in our high schools, there are elective courses for computer science. What, what do you think is the percentage of female students in those classes, where they can choose by themselves, whether they want to follow computer science or not? What do you think is the percentage in Austria, in Europe? It's difficult to guess, but try. 15%? No, it's, it's 1%. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I would have guessed. So we have a problem, you see? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Swani. It was a great talk. Thank you very much. I'm sure many others enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully this will lead to several people contacting you for yeah. collaborations. Uh, please share my uh, email address. Uh, yeah, you can yeah. also find it. Sure. We will, yeah, yeah. Sure. We'll do that. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Sonia. Yeah. Thank you so much for such an inspiring talk, and I'm sure everybody is eager to go and try out. And uh, we have a 15 minute break before we start the next session, but Savita has some interesting poll questions which she will take. And uh, we will start the next session, which is on CT and math at 3.30. So I'll Sonia, so, yeah. where are you going? <laughs> Once again, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, being the last day, we thought let's have some fun. So we are going to have fun with one of our good friends called Viva. Hope, uh, hope the screen is visible. Atul, is the screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's visible. Yes. 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 Yes.